Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome on another webinar from the Malaysian Obstetric Medicine Society titled Cervical Surplus. Now, ladies and gentlemen, apart from obstetric medicine, something which remains dear to my heart is prevention of preterm delivery. And one important procedure, which I believe is often beneficial if done in the right person at the right time, is cervical surclages. And hence, that brings to one important topic that we'd like to discuss today, cervical surclages. So ladies and gentlemen, I've got no conflict of interest in this talk, but however, it reminds me of one important quote when it often comes to mind talking about preterm deliveries, is that every day counts. It is not a countdown to delivery, but it's a count up to your due date. And I believe preterm deliveries can highly be prevented. So ladies and gentlemen, in the next 25 minutes, I would like to highlight four facts. When to surplus, how to surplus, what suture material to use, and what else are the issues surrounding preterm deliveries and cervical surplus. Ladies and gentlemen, here is my view about the cervix. I believe although we often blame the cervix, the number one villain, the invisible villain, is an infection. I believe there are two lethal combinations with regards to cervical insufficiencies and preterm deliveries. It is IVF and multiple pregnancies. It is a lethal combination. So if a woman needs an IVF, it is highly important to prevent a multiple pregnancy. And I believe that should be the goal of every single reproductive medicine specialist. I believe the cervix is extremely dynamic. A cervix is able to remodel. A funnel cervix can unfunnel. A shortened cervix can elongate. A shortened cervix can remodel after a stitch. Although for many, many years, in fact, since 1955, we are often engrossed with a high suture. But ladies and gentlemen, sometimes I believe a high suture causes more harm than benefits. So I believe it is not how high you place a suture, which is important, but I believe the technique is far more important than the placement of the suture. Although we often know of two commonly described techniques, three dot car and McDonald, I believe you should modify them if you're going to do an emergency surplus. Not too deep, not too high should be the principle for emergency surplus. So for example, ladies and gentlemen, if you were to do an elective surplus, you can place them as high as possible, not too high. You can go through 50% of the cervical depth. However, if you're going to do a rescue surplus, I believe you should be one third of the cervical depth. It, the aim is to obliterate the external os, not too high. If not, you're going to rupture the membranes and cause more harm than good. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe one of the major roles with maintaining the cervical integrity in preventing preterm deliveries is to ensure that the integrity of the cervical mucus junction is undisrupted. And hence, I treat all cervical insufficiencies as emergencies. It is quite difficult to differentiate between an ascending infection as compared to a descending infection. It is important to obliterate and maintain the integrity of the cervical mucus junction. The second most important fact I would like to highlight, it is extremely important to maintain the vaginal ecosystem as natural as possible because a change in the ecosystem may predispose the mother to an infection. I'm not a fan of probiotics, neither am I a fan of abusing antibiotics, but I believe we should maintain the ecosystem as near natural as possible. So even during cervical surclages, ladies and gentlemen, we usually avoid the use of Covidon. We avoid the use of chlorhexidine. Some people believe that normal cell line per se is sufficient and you don't really have to give mothers antibiotics if you were to undertake an inelective surplus. So what is the science related to preterm delivery, ladies and gentlemen? I believe preterm delivery is extremely complex. 
The cervix is often blamed because that is the only objective thing that we can visualize. That is the only objective measurement we can actually take, but it is often a silent infection, which is the culprit. I believe because of the complexity, I believe there's lack of randomization and many people perform retrospective cohorts failing to appreciate that it is far more complex than what we imagine. And sometimes infections is easier to screen than to see. I believe there's been a lack of definition about what is a normal cervical length in singleton, in pregnancy. And I believe just like any other complex cohort, there's always a normal gram for people with different heights, for people with different place. I believe most of the studies have undertaken prophylactic interventions, some of which may actually be more harmful than good. And hence, it is far more complex and complicated to read the literature or to present and talk about preterm babies. Unfortunately, in modern obstetrics, we do not hesitate to do a cesarean section, but it's a huge hesitation to perform a cervical surplus. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not invasive. Circlages are safe if you choose the right person, you choose the right patient and do it at the right time. Arabin pessary is far more dangerous than performing a cervical surplus. And I believe there's been a huge load about bad signs surrounding Arabin pessaries, and hence often that has caused more harm than good. Because number one, if it succeeds, it is not because of the pessaries, because the patient really needs nothing else. If it fails, it's because the pessary causes more harm with regards to infections than benefit. Points which I will justify in the next 20 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, the definition of an insufficient cervix, we have moved away from the term incompetent, but is now known as insufficient has been described back in the 17th century. The orifice of the woman is so slack that it cannot rightly contract itself to keep the seed was described in the 17th century. A fast forward, 1955 in Goa, India, this gentleman, Note Sri Dorka, described a technique to keep the cervix intact, and he described the Sri Dorka technique. Now, the Sri Dorka technique means you place the cervical circlage at the level of the internal os, you'll have to dissect the bladder upwards. At the same time, in half the globe across the world, another man called MacDonald in 1957 described an easier technique, also a cervical circlage, which is placed not at the level of the internal os, but from as high as possible from the level of the external os, and that is now known as the McDonald stitch. Now, ladies and gentlemen, personally, in my own clinical experience, I've never done a Sri Durkar suture. I've done hundreds of McDonald's surplages. If you choose the right person, if you do it at the right time and their technique is right, the outcomes are similar for both McDonald's and Sri Durkars. And that is what the science and files conclude as well. There are four types of cervical cerclages. <clears throat> the rescue cerclage, ladies and gentlemen, is just done to obliterate the external os. Do not go beyond 50% of the depth of the cervix, you're going to rupture the membranes. Do not go too high, you're going to rupture the membranes. One third, just obliterate the external os. Success rate is 50% for five weeks. If you have a patient who you need to do an ultrasound indicated cervix circlage, for example, the patient has got a shortened cervix, the recommendation is McDonald's circlage. I believe a Shredot card circlage will cause more harm than good. So once again, not too high because you're going to rupture the membranes, measure the cervical length, one third of the depth of the cervix. However, if you were to undertake an elective surplus, then you have got two options, McDonald or Shredot curve. Ladies and gentlemen, both is equally effective. Both is equally efficacious. A McDonald is easier to perform, less side effects, less complications, but it's best to do what you are experienced and trained in. The fourth type of surplus is known as an abdominal surplus. 
discharge. An abdominal circlage is usually done in patients who have got a previous tracheolectomy or a previously failed vaginal circlage where we have ruled out an infection. It is usually done pre-pregnancy. An open laparotomy is not recommended. The recommendation is to do a laparoscopic abdominal circlage or a robotic circlage. Keep it there. The patient needs a cesarean section and only to be removed, the patient has got a miscarriage, a complication, or once she has completed her family. So ladies and gentlemen, how do you manage a woman with a previous preterm delivery who comes now to you being pregnant? The first thing I think you should screen for infections. The leading cause of infections causing preterm delivery is GBS, is bacterial vaginosis. In my own clinical practice, I believe two other common culprits are E. coli and Klebsiella pneumonia. So screen for infections, talk about hygiene, but I believe there are no role for probiotics or routine antibiotics. Talk to the woman about lifestyle modifications, talk to her about hygiene, especially perineal hygiene. Ladies and gentlemen, active or passive smoking is a significant risk factor for preterm deliveries. You should talk to the woman and her partner about preventing passive smoking. Please do not ask the woman to bed rest. Please do not ask her to stop work and stay at home. Bed rest has got no implications at all with regards to preterm delivery. It may predispose her risk to a DVT, hence more harm than benefits. Then advocate a cervical screening from 14 to 24 weeks, not be looked for 14 weeks, because the first trimester pregnancy losses is usually due to a fetal cause. It is often after 14 to 24 weeks. When is the earliest time we can do a circlage? It is 12 weeks. Once you have ruled out an NM carefully, you have performed a trisomy screen. So 12 weeks circlages are recommended, can be done. And the latest time we do a circlage is at 24 weeks because beyond 24 weeks in some parts of the world, especially in European countries, the baby can be salvaged. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we now live in modern obstetrics. I believe there's no longer a role for prophylactic interventions. There's no role for prophylactic vaccines. There's no role for prophylactic progesterones. Similarly, there's no role for prophylactic circlages. Definitely no role for prophylactic pessary. It may cause more harm than benefit. So ladies and gentlemen, I think now in modern obstetrics, during an anomaly scan, we have evolved towards looking apart from at the fetus, apart from the light bulb volume, apart from looking at the placental location, you should also look at placental morphology and thickness. And one important organ, you should also look at the cervix. Although various guidelines are yet to recommend universal screening, one important guideline is the FIGO-like guidelines back in 2015 who now advocate universal measurement of the cervical length. So ladies and gentlemen, this is recommended. You don't really have to do a transvaginal scan for every single woman who walks into your clinic, but a transvaginal scan remains the gold standard. I think you can do a transabdominal scan if you have got a good long cervix, then you don't need a TVS. But if you're unsure, if you can't visualize the cervix in a transabdominal scan, then a transvaginal scan is recommended. Ladies and gentlemen, funneling has got no clinical implications. What is important is not funneling, but the actual cervical length, the unfunneled cervical length. Apart from cervical length measurement, one important test that I would like to advocate is the cervical sliding test. The cervical sliding test is an important test to establish and to interrogate cervical uh, integrity. So all you need to do is to press on the cervix. And if the cervix shortens, or if you can demonstrate cervical funneling, then the cervical sliding test is positive. This patient does have a cervical insufficiency and this patient may benefit from a cervical surcharge. So ladies and gentlemen, although the conventional teaching to measure the cervix, it should be unpressured probe. To do a cervical sliding test, you should apply a little bit of pressure on the cervix to demonstrate a cervical sliding test. Now, having done then, what else should you do? 
Now, how do you measure the cervix, ladies and gentlemen? You actually need to empty the bladder. It should be on a sagittal view. You should visualize three important structures, the cervical os, the external os, the canal and the endocervical mucosa all in one plane. Avoid undue pressure when you're going to measure the length, but apply pressure when you're going to do the cervical sliding test. Optimize the image to make it as big as possible. It's recommended to take three measurements, three minutes apart, and record the shortest cervical length, and that is the most important length of significance. So ladies and gentlemen, now, when do you do a cervical surprise? Let's go back in time, 1993, almost 28 years ago, and this was the paper that I read before being passed, passing out as a specialist. And everyone in my batch quoted this paper the MRC trial about cervical surplus. Now this paper quoted that one in 25 women actually may benefit from a cervical insufficiency and you should do cervical surplus, especially if the woman has had more than three recurrent pregnancy losses. Now, ladies and gentlemen, sadly, this paper was published 28 years ago. It was an era where ultrasound was not easily available and I believe this paper is no longer true in modern optics. I believe we should move away from history indicated surplus, because what we need to do now in modern obstetrics in modern world is an ultrasound indicated surplus. No longer prophylactic surplus, no longer history indicated surplus. You don't have to wait for a woman to lose three pregnancies, but you should do an ultrasound indicated surplus. So ultrasound indicated surplus means you should measure the cervix, do a cervical sliding test, and if it's short, make a diagnosis of a shortened cervix and then act on it. It is not the funnel, but it is the actual unfunneled length. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like to define the short cervix on three measurements, 25 millimeters, 15 millimeters, and 10 millimeters. The woman has got a cervix of 25 millimeters. If it's a singleton pregnancy and she had a previous preterm delivery, be concerned, she needs a cervical surplus. If she's got a multiple pregnancy, do not act of a measurement at 25, but all multiple pregnancies will eventually have a shortened cervix. The number of significance for multiple pregnancies is 15 millimeters, not 25. However, ladies and gentlemen, just like the length of the femur, just like the height, just like the BMI, every single woman will have her own individual length based on ethnicity and race. If she's got a singleton pregnancy, she's got no previous preterm delivery, then do not act on a cervical measurement of 25, but you should act on a measurement of 10 millimeters and below. But what is, ladies and gentlemen, what is even more important is not a single measurement. It is the trajectory. If the cervix has progressively remained the same, it is less of a concern. But if a normal cervical length is 37, that is reduced to 27, that is reduced to 17 over a short period of time, if ruled out infection, then perhaps think of a cervical cause. So one measurement is not sufficient. You need a serial measurements. You need to take a look at the trajectory and it is ideally between one to two weeks apart. So ladies and gentlemen, next let's take a look about twins. Now, where do we get the number of 15 millimeters for twin pregnancy? This comes from this wonderful systematic review from the ACOG paper. And it was a systematic review and meta-analysis. They realized that for multiple pregnancies, the number of 25 is not beneficial, but what is beneficial is a cervical length of 15 millimeters or a dilatation of the internal os of beyond 10 millimeters. So for multiple pregnancies, ladies and gentlemen, use the number of 15. Now, how do you manage a woman with a short cervix? As mentioned earlier, if she's got no previous preterm deliveries, a cervical measurement is 10 millimeters screen for infections, take a look at progression, 10 millimeters and below of a supplage, not an Arabian recipe. 
If a woman has got a previous preterm delivery, screen for infections, the number to act on is 25 millimeters. And similarly, she's got multiple pregnancies, screen for infections, the number to act on is a 15 millimeter. But yet again, it's important to look at the trajectory and the progression of the cervical plan. This wonderful paper, also published by Roberto Romero and group in the ACOG paper, wonderfully describes the benefits of vaginal progesterones. Now, all patients with singleton pregnancies with a short cervix were not advocated for cervical surplus, but were just given vaginal progesterones and they had good outcomes and showed that vaginal progesterone alone decreases the risk of preterm deliveries in women with a shortened cervix without any previous history of preterm deliveries. So ladies and gentlemen, in such group cohort of patients, they've ruled out infection, but the cervix remains short. One medication which is of importance is vaginal progesterones. However, ladies and gentlemen, having said that, in women who you do have had a surclutch, preventing an infection is extremely important. To insert a vaginal progesterone may sometimes cause more harm. And for patients without a cervical surclutch, I do use vaginal progesterones in my practice. But for patients who have had a cervical surclutch, I usually subject them to IM hydroxyprogesterone injections, namely because to prevent infections. Now, how about women who have got a short cervix? They were singleton pregnancies, no previous preterm deliveries. What is the level of significance? The level of significance, ladies and gentlemen, is 10 millimeters. And this wonderful paper was published by Berkela and friends. So no preterm delivery, singleton pregnancies, the level of significance is 10 millimeters on a trans vaginal scan. Next, let's talk about rescue surplages. Ladies and gentlemen, there are two types of rescue surplages. One is when the membranes are at the level of the internal os. Now, these patients have got better outcomes as compared to another group of patients. The recommendation is to do a rescue surplage. The success rate in such groups is 50%. However, another group of rescue surplage is when the membranes have protruded beyond the external os, and the membranes are in the vagina. This is the most difficult type of rescue surplage. And in these patients, you do have two options. Option number one is to do an amniocentesis, is to rule out an infection, and then to do a cervical stitch, because the risk of infections are higher in this group of patients. So ladies and gentlemen, in back in where I work, we do a lot of rescue surplages especially when it's open, be it it's at the level of the internal os if you have protruded beyond the internal os. The success rate depends whether the patient has got an infection or no infection. The incidence of rescue surclages in where I work, it's almost one every week, and most of them are associated with IVF pregnancies. In patients who have got purely a cervical cause, the outcomes are good, the patient has got an infective cause, the outcomes are more morbid. But we normally do not do amniocentesis and wait. We give them antibiotics, we give them progesterones, we move on and do a rescue surplage. We manage them as an emergency. So ladies and gentlemen, let's revisit again the types of rescue surplages. I believe the risk of infection can be as high as 59%. The success rate for elective surclages is 80% if it's done at the right time and the right technique. But the success rate for rescue surclages is 50% and the average prolongation is five weeks. So if you were to perform a rescue surplage at 19 weeks, please do not be happy. The patient has to be counseled that the patient may still have a risk of preterm delivery at 24, 25 weeks. On the other hand, if you were to perform a rescue surplage at 23 weeks, the patient still may be able to deliver at 27 or 28 weeks. So patients with rescue surclages, patients who have got membranes in the vagina, they've got two options. Option number one, tocolytic agents. The tocolytic of choice is indomethacin. Ladies and gentlemen, indomethacin is not contraindicated in the second trimester. It is contraindicated in the third trimester. 
because it causes premature closure of ductus arteriosus, but not in the second trimester. Indomethacin has been proven to be far superior. The recommended dose is 100 milligrams stat, 50 milligrams QID. Then you can do a rescue cervical cerclage. All you need is a wet sponge forceps. Put the patient head down under spinal position. Grab the cervix. Reduce the protruded membrane gently. You can provide uterine relaxation agents such as nitrous oxide and in the medicine. Do a cerclage, not too high, not too deep. Just obliterate the external os. Keep them in the hospital. Outcomes are 50% successful. Option number two, what is being advocated by the Roberto Romero group now in US is to do an amniocentesis. They specifically look for signs of infection. They do a point of care test called interleukin-6. If the interleukin-6 is high, it means the patient has got an infection and they treat the patient with antibiotics by giving three antibiotics. The three antibiotics is IV cefpiazone, IV metronidazole, and IV azithromycin, all to cover organisms of uh, the vagina. And once the infection is treated, then they advocate the patient for a surplus. So these are two options which is currently being advocated, mainly because, ladies and gentlemen, you don't really want to undertake a heroic procedure just to rupture the membranes in an attempt to salvage the pregnancy, and that may cause more harm than good. In my own clinical setting, ladies and gentlemen, I often go to option number one, localize them, give them antibiotics, triple antibiotics, do a rescue surplus, and I've not done any amniocentesis yet for this particular condition, but that remains a viable option. Now, I'd like to bring your attention to this wonderful paper which was recently published, where they had one patient where there was evidence of antibiotic administration alone, where the patient had a bulging membrane in the vagina, treated expectantly with antibiotics alone, and that patient was later taken to term to delivery. So, ladies and gentlemen, I also had similar outcomes where patients at 24 or 25 weeks who presented with bulging membranes, os is dilated, they are three centimeters dilated, they have got no contractions. Sometimes by giving them triple antibiotics alone may prolong the pregnancy by a few weeks. But the outcome depends whether they had the infection, whether the infection has been treated, or whether the fetus is infected as well. So sometimes doing nothing is an option, especially in such complex situations. So moving forward, ladies and gentlemen, what suture material do you use? I think traditionally we have been favored to use the Mercilon tape, ladies and gentlemen. But I'm sure everyone now who continue to do cervical cerclages can appreciate the Mercilon tape is no longer available in this part of the world. The suture that I use now is called this particular suture called the cervix set. It has got two sutures and it is also similar to the Mercilon tape. The difference is that the needle is actually a blunt needle. But ladies and gentlemen, in future, you don't really need to use a Mercilon tape. Some people believe that a proline or an Eticon bond tape is just as superior as a Mercilon tape. And I believe this is currently still being evaluated in Panama's control trials. So the C-stitch, which is currently being evaluated, might provide us with answer regarding what is the best suture material. It is perhaps not always mycelin. All you can use is a monofilament suture material per se to reduce the risk of infection. So ladies and gentlemen, it is sometimes not the suture material, but what is important is the technique, the right patient, the right patient selection, and done at the right time. Now talking about C-stitch, there's also another trial called the C-stitch 2 trial which is a randomized controlled trial looking into abdominal cerclages as compared to vaginal cerclages, results of which are both being currently anticipated. How do you do a cervical cerclage? So ladies and gentlemen, this is my own technique which I've defined over the years and over hundreds of cerclages that we have done. I believe maternal position is extremely important. 
the patient should be in a transparent position, head down is extremely important. You don't really need general anesthesia. Regional anesthesia is perhaps less harmful, more beneficial. The tocolytic agent that I use, particularly for rescue surplus, is indomethacine 100 milligrams. Sometimes you can also use nitric oxide, you can also use methodipine. Atosiban is not recommended because you might not have sufficient oxytocin receptors. The vaginal preparations is extremely important, ladies and gentlemen. As mentioned earlier, it's important to maintain a normal vaginal ecosystem. So antibiotics are not needed for elective cyclages. Antibiotics are only needed for rescue cyclages. I use normal saline. It is okay to use chlorhexidine. I believe povidon may cause more harm to good. It's important to use stirrups. It's important to ask for two large sim speculum. It's important to ask for four sponge for sepsis. I've got two assistants both on the patient's side. Ask for a particularly long needle holder. Don't struggle with a six centimeter. Ask for an eight or a nine centimeter needle holder. Get your cervical sutures, a mercilon tape or a proline or a monofilament is fine. Use a wet sponge forceps to reduce if you're going to do a rescue surplus. You don't really have to dissect the bladder, especially if you're going to do a rescue surplus. Avoid three o'clock, avoid nine o'clock. I usually place it at four to six o'clock and I place the knot posteriorly. One important technique, ladies and gentlemen, if you were to do an ultrasound indicated surplus, I've never done a history indicated surplus in the last three years. If you were to do an ultrasound indicated surplus, the cervical depth should be less than 50% of the cervical thickness. However, if you were to undertake an emergency surplus, going too deep may cause more harm you may rupture the membrane, so use a 30% of the cervical thickness. After the technique, I cover with hydroxyprogesterones because I am concerned about infections and vaginal ecosystem, so I usually shy away from vaginal progesterones. I do measure cervical length post surplus. Although the current recommendations and science is not to do a cervical length after a surplus, I normally do them two weeks later because the patient has got a normal cervical length after a surplus, that is a good prognostic factor. The patient can be managed as outpatient. The patient can return to work. However, the cervix continues to shorten after a surplus, then I will subject them to a secondary test, namely quantitative fetal fibrodactin. That remains positive. Then you can be assured that the patient has got a high chance of preterm delivery then you can keep the patient as inpatient, timely administer magnesium sulfate and DEXA, but not routinely and not prophylactic. The cyclages are removed at 37 weeks. The old practice is to remove them at 36 weeks. But ladies and gentlemen, if you remove them at 36 weeks, you're still not preventing preterm deliveries. Only a small minority of women will deliver before 37 weeks. And so I remove them at 37 weeks because my aim is to prevent a preterm delivery. So what is my technique? The first suture is placed between four to six o'clock, avoid three o'clock. I use a right hand. I avoid the using of a left-sided approach. My approach is always from right to left. Next, the second suture is placed from two to 12 o'clock. The third suture is placed from 12 to 10 o'clock. Yet again, I'm still using my right hand. The fourth suture is placed from 8 to 6 o'clock. And sometimes if the gap is too far, I do often sometimes use a fifth suture. And then I place the knot posteriorly. If you place the knot anteriorly, sometimes that may irritate the bladder. It causes more symptoms to the patient. And hence, a posterior knot placement is advocated. Now, how many sutures, how many knots do you do? Do you take three bites? Do you take four bites? Or do you take five bites? I believe as long as you can do a first string suture, that is sufficient. Most of the time, four bites. Sometimes you do have to take a fifth bite, especially if the gap is too far. But ladies and gentlemen, what is important, I believe, is how deep should you go in? Not too deep. Elective circlages, not beyond 50%, 
rescue circular just even more superficial, but not superficial, ideally 30%, and place the knot posteriorly. What is important is not the surgeon. What is important is the technique, is the mother's positions, is good assistant, good lighting, large sim speculum, and a long needle hole. What else is important, ladies and gentlemen? I believe everyone is well aware of the Maverick trial. That a Maverick trial was published a few years ago. It is a randomized multi-centered trial comparing trans-abdominal circlage as compared with trans-vaginal circlage, especially in women who have got a previous trachelectomy. And this paper showed that for women who had a previous trachelectomy, abdominal circlages are far more superior. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if a woman has got a failed previous vaginal circlage, it's good to reassess why was it failed. Was it too late? Was it elective or was it emergency? Is there signs of infection? If you have failed because of infection, it is okay to attempt another vaginal circlage. If it's a failed rescue circlage, it is okay to attempt another elective circlage. And usually in such patients where they have failed the previous vaginal circlage, I normally offer circlages as early as 12 weeks. So it's not all patients who have got a previous fail who needs an abdominal circlage, but one particular cohort is those who had a previous speculator. What lacks evidence, ladies and gentlemen, one common drug which is widely being abused for natural pregnancies is glufoscone. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure everyone is well aware, based on the PRISM trial, there is no role for glufoscone in prevention of miscarriages. Similarly, a dose of 10 milligrams of glufoscone does not prevent preterm delivery. I think we should stop administrating glufoscone for women in the name of preterm delivery. One progesterone has been proven to be beneficial. The vaginal preparations of eutrogestin given at 200 milligrams daily. However, the patient had a stitch, the patient has an infection, I err more towards an intramuscular form as compared to a vaginal preparation. But please don't give the vaginal preparation an oral form because the efficacy changes, the evidence is limited, the science is best for those with a vaginal preparation. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe we should stop abusing vaginal preparation. The science related to vaginal preparation is extremely weak. And I believe, just as what I've highlighted earlier, the main culprit in preterm delivery is an infection. Passeris does not protect the integrity of the cervix. It does not elongate, it does not change the angle. But what it does, it is a foreign body. It causes more infections. Most of these patients will leak at one moment of time. And the moment you have got a preterm delivery with a combination of infection, the outcomes and the incidence of HIE are far higher as compared to a woman who has got a preterm delivery without infections. So I believe the science related to Arabic pessary is completely lacking. Do not advocate bad place that has never been advocated to improve or prevent preterm delivery. Please do not place the mother on a reverse fender position. It is impossible to go against gravity unless you transfer the mother to the moon. And these four measures are not advocated, are not beneficial with regards to preterm prevention. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to spend the next two minutes and my important quote, if there's going to be one take home message from my entire talk, I believe it is time to bin the Arabin. I believe the Arabin has never really been proven to be important in all cohorts of patients, be it singleton pregnancies with a short cervix. Now, Zen Lima did a systematic review for all women with singleton pregnancies with a short cervix. Goya in the PSAP trial also did a similar meta-analysis. Nicoloides also did a meta-analysis. It was a randomized controlled trial studies. Ladies and gentlemen, if a woman has got a singleton pregnancy, short cervix, there's no role for arabin pessary. Leave her alone, she might not deliver. Give her vaginal progesterone, that may be helpful. How about a woman with a singleton pregnancy and a short cervix? Is it beneficial if you give her progesterone plus arabin pessary? So once again, ladies and gentlemen, this has 
been advocated. Now, Kabasin et al. looked into this particular group and realized that vaginal progesterone alone were better as compared to progesterone plus pessary. Why is that so? Because pessary causes infection, the woman may leak, the outcomes are poorer. Similarly, ladies and gentlemen, various other studies showed that the pessary and progesterone does not do better as compared to progesterone alone. Now, how about women with a circlage plus a pessary? Various studies showed this is far more harmful, no benefits, one option is good, the circlage alone is sufficient. Now, how about pessaries in multiple pregnancies? Can you do a prophylactic measure to prevent preterm delivery? The answer is no. Stop it too, or stopped halfway. They used a cervical length of 35, not 15. And they even realized that even at these measurements, if you were to use Arabic pessaries, it does not and did not prevent preterm deliveries. So ladies and gentlemen, I believe the science related to pessaries is poor. It has never really been proven in various systematic analysis in various parts of the world, in various randomized control trials. I believe it is controversial. I believe the single intervention for a cervical insufficiency is a cervical surplus. Now, what is new with regards to cervical surplus? Earlier, we spoke about rescue surplus. Earlier, I spoke about using a wet sponge forceps to reduce. Now, the people in Japan has wonderfully created this device together with Roberto Romero. They call it the uniconcave balloon. When you place this balloon at the level of the axle os, you inflate it, the balloon inflates and reduces the bulging. This is one device, a novel device that can be used if you were to undertake a rescue surplus. Alternatively, ladies and gentlemen, you can use this. You can use a wet sponge forceps. You can also use a Foley's catheter where you place the catheter at the external os, inflate the balloon, the catheter will slowly displace it behind. That is also one alternative. So ladies and gentlemen, in the last five years in where I've worked, I've used zero Arabic pessaries, although I managed a significant number of preterm deliveries beyond hundreds. I've done zero prophylactic surplus, the only surplus that we do in our center or all ultrasound indicated surplus. If you strictly follow ultrasound indicated surplus, 40% of your patients will not require a surplus Progesterones alone will be beneficial because the source would have been an infection. Progesterone alone would be sufficient to prevent preterm deliveries. We've done now 140 over ultrasound indicated surplus. Our outcomes are almost 95%. 96% of them delivered beyond 37 weeks. My own failure rate is 4%. But 4% of them for vaginal surplus Significant number of them had infections. The number one infection is GBS. This is followed by E. coli and Klebsiella, and a small minority of them had pseudomonas. We have done over 45 rescue surplus, namely most of them had IVF and multiple pregnancies. 11% of them ruptured membranes during the procedure. Our outcomes are 50%, but for five weeks. But in the successful group, they had no infections, to manage to take the pregnancy to term. So having managed all these complicated patients in hundreds of them, I believe, ladies and gentlemen, the technique is important. Patient selection is important. And counseling of patient is extremely important. So to summarize, ladies and gentlemen, I believe we should not lose the art of the cervical surplus. It remains one important obstetric intervention which is extremely, extremely important and saves life. I think we should move away from prophylactic or history-indicated surplus. The MRC trial was published 28 years ago. In modern obstetrics, we should only be doing ultrasound-indicated surplus. I believe we should universally screen everyone's cervix during the anomaly scan. The length matters. The sliding test matters. Do not get worried with a funneling. I believe although people talk about a great shaded car, a good McDonald's surplus is sufficient, is good enough, 
if you have the diagnosis right. The woman has got a previous preterm delivery. The number to remember is 25 millimeters. However, the woman has got a multiple pregnancy. Do not use a prophylactic arabid pessary. The number to remember is 15 millimeters. However, if the woman has got no previous preterm delivery, then only act if the cervix is below 10 millimeters. But at every cost, at every juncture, please look for an infection, treat, think of an infection. If the woman presents with a bulging membrane, there is still a role for rescue surplage. It's important to counsel them appropriately. It is important to rule out or treat the infection. And moving so forward, some group of people recommend amniocentesis and interleukin-6 to look for infections. But triple antibiotics seems to be the way forward. I believe there's a role for rescue surplage, but I believe three antibiotics are important. Ceftriazone, claritromycin, and metronidazole are three antibiotics which are extremely important. For women with a short cervix, no previous preterm delivery, there's definitely a role for vaginal progesterones that is recommended, but the cervical length measurement is 10 millimeters. Ladies and gentlemen, I think the science is extremely controversial with regards to Arabian pessary. It has widely been abused. I think we should stop abusing the general pessaries. I believe there's no role for Arabian pessaries, be it therapeutically, be it prophylactically. I believe a pessary is no replacement for a surplage. If you think the patient has got a cervical insufficiency, the gold standard and treatment of choice is a cervical surplage. And if you were to tocolize, endometrosine seems to be promising. I'd like to end with one quote, ladies and gentlemen, it is the insufficient science which remains the challenge. It is not the insufficient cervix. With that, thank you so much for your kind attention. If you do have any questions, please reach out to us at www.obstetricmedicine.my. I'll be more than happy to answer all your questions with that. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Take care, ladies and gentlemen.